Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, how was the recorded lecture? Was that did that work? That work for you? Good, because I may have to cancel Thursday's class as well. Maybe, might, and if I do, I'll upload another video. You look so happy about that. That's that's not good. Um, I'll let you know later tonight if I choose to do so, um, only because I got stuff to do and it's more well convenient to upload a video instead of coming here in person. But I might still come in person, so we'll, I'll let you know about that. Um, other things to talk about. After years of teaching this class with no support from the university, this year they gave me a TA. Then they went and gave me another TA. So I got two TAs. I don't have enough for them to do. So feel free to bug the TAs and have them, like, you know, do what they're getting paid for. It also means that I'll be doing no marking at all. So I've got TAs now to mark your stuff. That's fantastic. Um, the other TA, her name, her name is Annika, and her information is now on the website. I'll ask her to come and introduce herself uh, in a couple of weeks as well. Uh, as well, uh, Saturday, last plea for the AGHN Global Health Conference. Is anybody going? Saturday's conference? One, two, that's it. No more? All right, fine, fine. It's usually a good, uh, good event, and there's uh, other than me, there are actually good speakers there. And on Wednesday, uh, on the website, I've announced CHIO has their Global Health Half Day. Uh, again, I'm speaking of that one, too. If you are RSVP for that, they will feed you. And if you're not interested in free food, then what are you doing in school? That's all i got to say. So today, we're going to talk about the institutions that fund international and global health uh, and do other kinds of work as well. It's not possible to talk about this field at a professional level without giving you know some thought to uh, the large organizations that do the bulk of the non-state work. Um, so we're looking at the big organizations, uh, and by no means should this be an exhaustive list of organizations, just a, a taste so you can speak authoritatively and confidently about them. Um, and essentially we're talking about the big ones like the World Bank and places like that. Da, 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 da. Uh, I gave this talk, or a version of it, at Carlton a couple weeks ago, and I used this, uh, this slide, which I thought was useful, because that talk was mostly about non-state actors, and that can include even groups like Anonymous, you know, or even maybe even terrorists and extremists. But usually we're talking about corporations and uh, non-governmental actors or actors of this nature, who's also a non-governmental actor who does a lot of interesting work globally too. Okay. On the pre-class questionnaire, one of the questions was, what is an NGO? And every year I get interesting interesting ideas about that. Some people actually think National Geographic Organization. NGO simply means a non-governmental organization. And it, it covers a, a wide field of possible kinds of groups. In general, we like to think of them as non-profit. Uh, lately, though, people have been expanding that definition to include some corporate for-profit activities. There's no hard and fast rules about what constitutes an NGO, except it's not part of the government, except sometimes it kind of works hand-in-hand -hand with the government. So um, as you'll see, uh, government has a strong role to play in how these organizations are administered, and what their policies are, and definitely where their funding comes from. But most of the global health and development work in the world is done by NGOs. So if you're looking for a career in this field, you're really looking for a career that begins with some kind of partnership with an NGO. Let's go back to our story. So we've been touching upon the story a little bit in the last couple of weeks. The story begins at the end of World War II. Remember, at the end of World War II, the world was broken. A devastating war had uh, shattered empires, collapsed economies, killed a lot of people, and yet there was new wealth, new power, new authority, new hope, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned, uh, you know, in the history of global health lecture, how much that started this, this new way of thinking about top-down approaches, vertical programming, horizontal. We, we, we did that, right? Vertical programming. Okay, good, thanks. I get my classes confused sometimes. Like, do I actually cover that? Good. But um, it was also a, an opportunity to see the old way of thinking replaced with a new way of thinking. This new way of thinking was built into the emerging Cold War between the uh, Soviet bloc and the Western world. We also think, or well, they also thought, that one of the reasons for World War I and World War II was a collapse of the world's financial system. And there was an attempt to sort of prevent that from happening again by creating a more cohesive set of agreements and relationships around the world regarding finance. So the great powers, the great powers essentially were the people who won World War II. They met to rebuild the world's financial system. And that gave us the Bretton Woods agreements. Did we talk about Bretton Woods already? 
Again, I'm old. I forget things. You've not heard these words come out of my mouth before. Excellent. Good. I bet. Things work out the way it's supposed to be. So I have a little bit of video uh, for you to watch here. Um, everyone loves the videos. Let me see if I can... Okay, you get the idea. A bunch of old farts met in New Hampshire to talk about stuff like that. I usually play that film to kill time, but we haven't got enough time to kill. I also love, uh, you guys are too young to remember what it was like watching movies in high school. Uh, back in my time, you, have, you actually have videos and DVDs and things like that. I had like film strip that would skip, and there's one guy that would narrate everything, and he sounded just like this. Like the 1940s, it sounded just like that. That that invitation killed back in the 70s, and you guys is a moderate laugh. All right, cool. So um, the thing about the Bretton Woods uh, uh, meeting is that it led to the founding of a series of institutions that today we call the Bretton Woods institutions. Most of them fell away, but we were stuck with a couple of them today that still manage a lot of the money going to low-income countries. And every now and then you read the papers, you'll find a call for a new Bretton Woods. Look for that phrase and when you read the papers, as I'm sure you do, and you go right to the financial section and talk about world economics, as I'm sure you do. Right? The new Bretton Woods, because we're always looking for a new way of visualizing or conceptualizing world finances so that they do not lead to, again, a large-scale global crisis uh, and large-scale um, uh, wealth inequality. So... The Bretton Woods system was a system of exchange rates amongst member countries and ways in which you know, currency could be uh, valued against each other. Prior to this, different countries set their own exchange rates, and they still kind of can, but there's an agreement that there's some relationships uh, um, underpinning these exchange rates. And um, part of this was attaching us to the gold standard, so your currency has to be worth something relative to the gold. Nixon took the Americans off the gold standard in the 70s. Canadians followed shortly after, and so um, today – currencies all over the place. So a lot of the stuff they agreed upon no longer applies today. However, a couple of key institutions do sustain themselves. First is the World Bank. Dun, 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 dun. So the World Bank is in Washington, D.C. I used to live in Washington, D.C., and it was great because if I get bored and, and felt bad about myself, I'd try to be even worse about myself by taking a walk down the World Bank, and you see that it's literally gold. I'm not sure if it's made of gold or it's got gold tincture, but it was gold. And, ah, that's where all the money is. It was, and I don't get through the front door because I'm a nobody because the security is pretty tight. It's, it's fantastic. So they're part of what's called the World Bank Group, which includes these series of smaller institutions. But when we talk about the World Bank in common parlance, we're actually talking about two components of the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the International Development Association. So these two really are the things that um, uh, are associated with global health and development. They fund the large projects. What they do is they, interest, they, they issue low-interest or no-interest loans to low-income countries. And in fact, they are the source of most of the debt in low-income countries. Um, if you want to see who's a member, you can go to this link, and really everybody's a member. There's a few countries that aren't. Canada's a member. 
And here's some examples of the projects they fund. Uh, almost $30 million to increase cotton production in Uganda, $12 million to reconstruct parts of Haiti, uh, $25 million to promote privatization of real estate in Moldova, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the kinds of projects they fund are big, like um, dams, building dams, things like that, large-scale projects that other people uh, can't afford to fund. No other NGOs have this kind of budget. And you'll see a, a trend emerging from these examples. Do you see a trend, by the way? Do you see a commonality in the kinds of things they're sort of focused on? Anybody? The World Bank is very business-associated, and so one of the recurring criticisms is that really they're all about just making the wealthy wealthier, one could argue, or they're about creating um, vassal states for to become markets for for American products, all of which is you know rational criticisms. Um, sometimes these large scale projects don't have a lot of downstream validity, and sometimes they have a lot of negative impacts that haven't been well thought out. Those are the criticisms. On the other hand, they are definitely injecting a lot of money into these societies, so there's a balance here. It depends on your political perspective. Are these good things or are all these bad things? So they get their money from us, from contributions from donor countries. Amongst, uh, in Canada is one of them. We, we respond for about 3% of, of their donor money, and you can see our role if you go to um, our finance ministry's website. They also <clears throat> invest their money. Being with the World Bank, you would think they know how to invest. So they invest their money to maintain their, um, their money, and they sell bonds as well. Like I said, they're in Washington, D.C., and they're supposedly independent from... Um, national in interest. However, they are traditionally headed by an American. Uh, in fact, usually the American president appoints the head of the World Bank. I'm not sure if that appointment is a real appointment or just a strong suggestion that they vote on, but in general, nobody becomes head of the World Bank unless the American president says, I like that guy. Yep. So the World Bank doesn't deal with individuals or organizations. It deals directly with governments. And they are ostensibly an international organization. Like I said, it's the U.S. president who really has a lot of Im impact on them. Criticisms. As I mentioned, they are dominated by the wealthy nations, and Canada's among those wealthy nations. Um, fewer than 15% of the world's population controls almost half of the votes in the World Bank. And one could argue, and others have, that their policies are, are essentially to remake the economies of poor countries to service the needs of rich countries. How does that work? Well, by making them essentially markets for our products. Um, why do we want them to have jobs and to, and to have income so they can buy Coca-Cola and things like that? One could argue. One could also argue that because they're giving out so many loans, they're prolonging the debt cycle for these poor countries who need to borrow money in order to build their infrastructure. The money is not going to come any other way. But they're so eager to lend money uh, at interest that they never get out of a debt cycle. And I mentioned... Um, Many claim that the, the projects that they fund are poorly thought out in terms of downstream effects and uh, how much damage they can do. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that not a whole lot of thought has been gone, gone into how we evaluate these large-scale projects, and evaluation is a relatively new idea in development. Um, and so nowadays, you know, grants come with a little, little tag that says 5% uh, of your grant must be set aside for evaluation, and no one knows how to do it, so they hire some schmuck to go and do the evaluation. So... Now we're kind of smartening up to that fact. And, of course, the overriding criticism is that maybe their agenda is actually to support American business interests. I'm going fast because we have a lot of stuff to cover today. But if I uh, stumble on my words or something, just stop me and I'll go over what I'm saying. So um, since their founding, uh, the World Bank has loaned poor countries almost $400 billion, and uh, they're owed almost $200 billion. As I mentioned, they are the world's largest creditor, and they specialize in structural adjustment programs. I mentioned earlier what those are. Do you remember what those are? Structural adjustment programs. These are uh, requirements for um, uh, recipient nations to modify their economies in certain ways that are consistent with neoliberal economic beliefs. So, um, for example, oh, do I have the answer? Okay. I've got examples. One of the primary ones is reducing the value of your currency. So if you receive World Bank money, you are usually required to reduce the value of your currency. Why? Why? Why does anybody reduce the value of the currency? Any ideas? 
everyone's frantically writing things down, but no one's got any ideas. Yes? Exactly. So your exports are cheaper. You're more likely to have market share abroad. On the other hand, if I reduce my currency, what can't I do? Yeah. I can't buy. Suddenly I can't afford to buy the world's products. Which is a little problematic if, you know, uh, it's, it's contrary to the early criticism that they're creating markets for our products. Well, if I'm making you poor, how are you going to buy my products? So there's some, there's some uh, conflict there. Um, and you have to open the borders to allow foreign products in. You can't be protectionist about your own products. In other words, they're trying to make these countries integrated into the global trade network, um, perhaps to their disadvantage. The current president is this guy, Dr. Jim Yong Kim. Okay, moving on. The IMF is the next institution we're going to talk about. The IMF is the International Monetary Fund, and they are also down the road from the World Bank in Washington, D.C. And they're also the product of the Bretton Woods Agreement. They're probably the two standing Bretton Woods institutions that have survived the last uh, seven years. Um, and this is their, you know, their stated goal. They're going to promote high employment, facilitate trade, economic growth, reduce poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where the World Bank is headed by an American, the IMF is headed by a Western European. So currently, I think the current head is French. I think the last head is French as well, or she's Swiss. One of the two. She speaks French. That's close enough, right? Um, and much like uh, the World Bank, her, uh, their funds are provided by donor countries like Canada. They focus on remaking economies, not funding projects. They do occasionally fund projects, but they're focused on actually coming in and just taking your economy apart and remaking it from the ground up. Um, so this is uh, the percent of the total voting shares amongst members of the IMF. The USA is the biggest... Uh, contributor, therefore, has the biggest say in what the IMF does. Japan is number two. Where's Canada? Where's Canada? We're down here. So we're in, we're in the mix, but sorry, not among the top five. The differences between the IMF and the World Bank. This is a standard exam question amongst first-year political science students. Um, could I ask you these things? Who knows? I'm an asshole. I can ask lots of things. So the World Bank finances economic development. The IMF finances essentially good behavior on the economic world stage. So the World Bank will fund large projects. They will try to raise productivity, but the IMF will tell you to set your exchange rates. They'll lend money to you, in, like to a government in an emergency, um, and they work to make monetary policies transparent. So they essentially want to make sure that the, uh, the nation they're working in is part of the global monetary system. The World Bank is trying to address their poverty issues in principle. So the criticism of the IMF is that they too are bound to too many conditionalities. For example, currency devaluation. The example I have here is that uh, Jamaica used to have a uh, uh, currency rate worth, worth more than the U.S. dollar, but they fell into trouble, and the IMF says, you want our help, you have to reduce your currency to being worth less than two cents. Okay, so that's happened there. One could also say that they tend to respond to crises rather than trying to prevent them. On the other hand, what are they supposed to do? Say, hey, you, you're about to go bankrupt. You need our help. You know, they can't go in unless someone asks them. And they're not perceived as having a high success rate. The, uh, the great success story, though, is India. So India in the early 90s was a basket case economy, and they, were, um, they had enough foreign exchange, really, for to last a couple of days. Uh, you need foreign exchange to buy things like fuel to run your factories. And India was about to go completely bankrupt. Their government was uh, dysfunctional to the point where the Supreme Court was off, was making direct orders to the Postal Service to, um, you know, to pay their employees and things like that. So the IMF showed up, and um, they transformed India. Now there was a lot of suffering, and many could argue there is still suffering as a result of the transformations. But India is one of the great economic success stories of the early 21st century. Is it because the IMF? They will say so. Others will say. It's do other things. So um, the example I'm, I'm fond of giving all the time is of, of Limca and Thumbs Up Cola uh, in India. I think I talked about that already in this class, but I'll say it again. So um, these were indigenous colas in, the, in India that were quite good, and for the longest time American companies are trying to get into the Indian cola market, but their policies kept them away. By accepting IMF help, they had to reduce their... Um, uh, there were exclusionary practices, and of course, Coca-Cola and Pepsi came in, outcompeted all of the brands, essentially bought 
Limca, and Thumbs Up. So that's the way those things work. This is the current head of the IMF, and she is Swiss or French. I don't know. I can't keep track of this. Okay, moving on. The Red Cross. Everyone loves the Red Cross because they do all these nice things in times of crisis, but they're actually a set of loosely affiliated uh, bodies. We have the National Red Cross, which is in each country. Um, They're the ones that people tend to give blood to. In Canada, we don't give blood to the Red Cross. Who do we give blood to? No one's giving blood here? Thank you. And why do we have the Canadian Blood Services rather than the Red Cross? Health science students, really? Yes? That's right, but why? Why was Canadian Blood Services invented? It was invented in the late 80s, I believe. Sorry? Let's hear some whispering. Close, Hep B. It was Hep C, rather. So um, there's a Hep C crisis in the 80s when uh, it was called the Tainted Blood Scandal. You can Google that if you want. So um, uh, Red Cross was collecting blood and if I remember correctly, improperly testing it, and so some people were receiving tainted blood. So the government uh, passed a new law, created the Canadian Blood Services to be in charge of Canadian blood um, receipt, and uh, that's why we have that. So, um, but the Red Cross and other countries are in charge of collecting blood. We have, I love asking people, like, we have, they have the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. Why is there a Red Crescent? People often, obviously you guys, I'm sure, can figure it out. We need a Red Crescent in Muslim countries, Red Cross in Christian countries. It makes sense, but it takes the general public a long time to figure that out. And there's essentially two bodies here. We have um, the, the National Red Cross and this thing called the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. So the International Committee of the Red, Red Cross was found in 1863, and they're the ones who show up um, to prisoners of war for countries that have, have signed on to the Geneva Convention, and they bring the uh, the care package. If you've ever seen on World War II movies, the prisoners get taken, they wait for their Red Cross package. Everyone knows that? We'll look for it next time, next time you watch a prisoner of war movie, as I'm sure you all do. Who doesn't? So they all get their, their, their care package from the Red Cross, which includes like a shaving kit, letters from home, um, coffee, chocolate, and they can trade to the guards and stuff. Um, and they're the ones who make sure that no one's being abused and, and uh, uh, will deliver uh, letters to your girlfriend and things like that. So their mandate is to protect life and dignity during armed conflict. On the other hand, the International Federation of the World Cross are the ones that respond to international disasters. So they're the ones we give all the money to, and the country usually matches donations in the event of large-scale humanitarian disaster, like earthquakes and hurricanes. Um, We're going to talk at length in a future lecture about the difference between humanitarian relief and development relief. The two are politically quite distinct and ethically ethically quite distinct. The Red Cross is into humanitarian relief, which is an easy sell. So they are interested in these things, promoting uh, humanitarian principles, supporting national groups with disaster preparedness, local health care projects, and things like that. So I remember um, back in 2004, during the Asian tsunami, um, countries like Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Thailand, and a couple others were devastated by that tsunami, and the Red Cross was responsible for rolling out their aid. But it takes them a while to get started because they've got these enormous fleets of trucks and and barges and a fleet of airplanes and all these things. They're the ones who set up the refugee camps and go and do the heavy lifting. But there's a a time period where they're not getting in because it takes a while for that machine to start rolling. So we we set up a a small NGO for Sri Lanka that was essentially a bunch of guys in in motorboats who would deliver things like um, uh, antiseptics, feminine hygiene products, you know, uh, baby formula. These are things you need in the short term and disasters like that. So there's a role for these small NGOs to fill in the gaps when the large ones like the Red Cross can't get moving fast enough. So imagine a massive 18-wheeler truck can't get over a highway that's been washed out by tsunamis, but a powerboat can. So there's a role for everybody. Takes us to Doctors Without Borders, everybody's favorite NGO, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF. And... Um, they were founded in 1971 during what we call the Biafran Civil War. That's the Nigerian Civil War. They're in Geneva, pretty big uh, annual budget, and any time any American TV show wants to have some heroic doctor, they always mention they had a stint of the MSF, whatever. 
You know, they've also got all kinds of splinter groups that have gone on to do similar work. Uh, Merlin's one of them. I briefly worked with Merlin. I was going to be the head of malaria in Tajikistan for Merlin, but I chickened out the last second. Uh, yeah, I, ch- I chickened out of shit. <laughs> it was scary. It's like, really? I don't want to be head of malaria. That's, that's horrible. Um, uh, but they won the Nobel Prize in '99, and their 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 head during that um, getting that prize is now professor at U of T. I think he may have left recently, so um, we had access to him for a while. Uh, so their their motivation was to give emergency care during armed conflict to civilians, because the theory is the soldiers are already taken care of. So I'm going to say something problematic that offends some people, um, but the stats bear me out, is this. In modern warfare, probably one of the safest things you can be on the battlefield is a soldier. I know it's a problematic thing to say, but bear with me, because the, the civilians are the ones getting shot on, and they don't have a massive hospital machine moving behind them. right? So the actual casualty rate for the soldiers is relatively low compared to that of civilians. So... MSF's goal was to make sure that the civilians were taken care of as well. To do so, they vowed not to take a side. This way, people will always let them in. If we're not taking sides, then you know we're not going to be seen one well as the other. But this brings up criticisms of them. So, like I said, they're they're they've got things like um, they've moved on from giving just emergency care to having mass vaccination campaigns, sanitary systems, health education, all the all the cool stuff. Um, so I mentioned that um, they they don't take sides, and that's a marketing point that can be utilized by others. During the Yugoslavian Civil War in the uh, early 90s, uh, NATO had set up refugee camps and was in charge of you know giving out uh, support to various kinds of people, and they give military protection to groups like MSF who run the field uh, doing their jobs. NATO decided to offer their own medical assistance two refugees during this conflict. And their rationale was not just to give care, but to say, hey, we're the good guys. Don't be mad at us. We're here to actually help out. MSF got pissed off at this and said, look, that's, that's not your mandate. People, you're walking around with military gear. You represent one side of the conflict. If you start giving out medical care, people will start to distrust medical care in general. And NATO insisted that, no, that's our job, and you better stop doing it. So MSF said, well, if you do so, then we will leave the refugee camps and set up our own care centers. And NATO said, well, if you do that, we will pull out our military support for you so you won't get any security on the field, and you'll be subject to, you know, um, raids by by barons. Yes, sorry. The Yugoslavian Civil War. All right. Um, so MSF responded with, uh, well, if you deny us security, we will hire our own security, as in mercenaries. And that actually started up by conversations with various mercenary groups. And so NATO backed down. That's an example of you know, the kinds of political p- plays that are happening all the time because they're valuable not just for the care that they give, but the fact that they are perceived to be impartial. That's an enormous marketing component. However, as a result of being impartial, there are some that would criticize them and this one article calls uh, what they do a, a case of MSF syndrome. And the argument goes like this. If there's a conflict happening, um, and, or uh, more importantly, the conflict is between an evil side and a, bad, and a good side. And the evil side is tyrannical, some despot, some, you know, some authoritarian. And you show up and you start giving care to people. You are removing a source of their discontentment and you are preventing them from finding the motivation to join the fight against their, their oppressor. That's the way the argument goes. Whether or, not you, whether or not you agree with that argument is not a story, but that's the argument. So there's something to be said for, um, A, giving sucker, giving support to um, people who otherwise would be rising up in opposition, and B, relieving the government of its responsibilities to give this support because one assumes that it's always the existing government's job to do so. All right, so there it is. Okay, moving on. WHO. Found 1948, uh, after World War II again, and it was uh, motivated by a big cholera epidemic. I think it was cholera in Egypt around that time. People said, well, we need to organize our shit and get things together. So this is their objective. And I mentioned in the first class that their their definition of health is a big deal. It sort of changed the way we think about 
politics and health and development by saying that health is not just a state of, of disease but the lack of well-being suddenly you can make anything health-based you can make uh, politics health-based the type of government you have the type of economy you have whether or not you have a job all that determinants of health stuff that this program is built upon that you're sick of that comes out of the founding of who but as a result some governments you know, are are skeptical of WHO's involvement in things because they're seen as being meddling at times. This is their project. They do fund projects um, to some extent. They conduct some amount of surveillance, one could argue poorly. They develop tools. Uh, indicators we talked about last class, they are the ones that, that develop some of them like the IC9 system. Standards, okay, what's DOTS? Anyone know what DOTS is? You heard that term before? We'll talk about it when we talk about major diseases. Yeah, yeah. So it has to do with tuberculosis. It stands for Directly Observed Therapy or Treatment Short Course. And what it is, it's a, it's a process of treating tuberculosis. Because the problem with tuberculosis is that people don't take their drugs when they're supposed to take them over the course of the entire regimen. So what you do is you directly observe them. You actually go to their house, you give them the drug, maybe give them some food too, you watch them take it, right? You go back, next day you go back to the house, you give them the drug, you watch them, you directly observe them take it, and this goes on for the six, 13 weeks, however long the treatment course is. Okay, wh why is it important to have directly observed therapy? Why do you think? For a bacterial disease, yes. Exactly right. right. So that's exactly right. So the second you start feeling good about yourself, you stop taking your drug, because the drugs make you feel rotten. So why would you want to take them? Um, but it's important to, to finish the course. So they're the ones that develop the standard for DOTS that we all adhere to. They do some research, has some campaigns like, oh, you can stop TV. It's a really lame campaign. So it doesn't really work. And we, you mentioned the IC9. And they do maintain the databases that um, I've directed you to in the past on the website. Um, they're politically... <laughs> I'm recording this, so I've got to be careful what I say on permanent record. They're a little problematic, a little dysfunctional at times. Um, so I, I did some consulting for them recently, and you show up to Geneva, and uh, there's an amazingly wealthy, enormous organization. You show up in the building, it looks like a 1940s high school. Like, this, really, this is this is it, right? Until you get to the top levels where a director is, and then it's palatial, it looks over the Alps, and it's fantastic, but the rest of it is bombed out and nightmare. But the cafeteria is incredible. There's like kangaroo steaks and things like that. And for a fake vegetarian like me, that's problematic but delicious. So it's, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> okay, criticisms. Very bureaucratic. Oh, my God, it's so bureaucratic. Right? So um, we, so many uh, uh, dictates and, and policies that nobody knows about, me endless meetings that often are even written down sometimes. Um, like when I was consulting with them, our, my task was to do a bibliometric analysis looking at their publications, and they didn't even know what publications they had. It was that confusing because different different uh, groups would just do something and move on and not keep track of it. Um, people think they're inefficient. i got to say, uh, in the field, when we go to various countries, um, the technicians we work with, if the WHO sends you a technician, in my experience, I'll say for the record, for the recording, in my experience, that's my caveat, so don't get sued, um, the WHO technician tends to be the least able of the ones that are sent. The American ones tend to be pretty good, the British ones tend to be pretty good, the WHO ones not that great. Um, so as I mentioned, the definition of health uh, opens the door to a variety of political opportunities. And much like everything else we talked about, their interventions are not well evaluated. So Canada, moving on, Canada used to have a thing called CETA. CETA does not exist anymore. CETA stands for the Canadian International Development Agency. This is not an NGO. This is actually a, a, a government arm, um, um, essentially a ministry. CETA has since been folded into International Affairs Canada, and under the Trudeau government, it became Global Affairs Canada. So it's all kind of moved together, which should tell you something. Yes? Yeah, it depends on your perspective, right? It, is it, what's its job? That's the question. What's this, so Ebola really sort of um, put a lens on, on that question because they were not leaders in the field during Ebola. And the question was, well, if they're not going to do it, who's supposed to do it? CDC did it, 
right? So the Americans showed up, and they're the, they were the heroes on the ground for Ebola. It wasn't WHO. And WHO says, well, that's, that's, that's not our job. Our job is to provide technical assistance if you ask us. Really? We thought your job was to read in the field. So there's a crisis right now in, in figuring out their, their purpose. And, like, if you go to their headquarters, across the street is um, uh, UNAIDS, right? And UNAIDS, really well organized, well resourced. Their building is beautiful. I look across at Envy. Oh, I want to look over there. How come I can't be over there? I'm stuck here. Right? So um, there's, there's a lot of accretion of bad practices and bureaucratic heaviness that is problematic. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, they are in crisis in some ways, no question. But then again, every large organization is. Yes? Second Trudeau government. Okay, it's a recent thing. The movement to global affairs Canada is a recent thing. So um, you can. This is obviously a slide I made in the Harper years. Now it's global affairs in the Trudeau years. So CETA is, or well, now global affairs, is responsible for Canadian-based uh, health and development. Now there's a reason that it's part of global affairs. Global affairs is also where our diplomats are. Our uh, are assigned and things like that. Previously, they're separate. Health and development was a separate issue from politics and international relations. Now they're together. So in one way, we can say, well, these are being transparent. We know now that um, health and development are just an aspect of diplomacy and international relations. So it's transparent. Previously, one can say that it, one could argue that uh, we're pretending that we're doing these things altruistically when, in fact, they're leverages for for making uh, other countries do certain things. Um, these criticisms, though, still apply. So poor evaluation, poor impact assessments, right? And then these two here. One of the criticisms the common man or woman always has of the amount of development money we spend is, why are we spending all this money over there when we have struggling people over here? Guess what? The money doesn't go over there. It stays right here, right? So overpaid consultants keep the money right here. There are millionaires who have made their fortunes on development work, and the money stays right here. When we give money to other countries, very often it is we talk about aid in the future called Tide Aid. Tide Aid is when, here, here's X millions of dollars, but you must spend it on Canadian products. That's the way it works. So we're not losing anything. It's just it's staying right here. So that's part of the criticisms. Um, when a uh, there's a th we used to have this thing called PSUs. PSUs were public support units. They're still there. They're called something else now. So if you have a CETA-funded project, or now a global affairs-funded project, they will give you an office in a PSU unit in the country that you're doing your work in. So you'd show up, and that's great. You don't have to hire a receptionist or secretary of staff. There's a building right there. I've got a fax machine, an email address, a phone. I can hit the ground running. But then the interesting thing you notice, you look around, and the other people in the offices, yeah, some of them are doing development work, but a lot of them are, just, are corporations. And they're there riding, again, my opinion, for the record I say that, <laughs> uh, my opinion, they're riding on the coattails of the good work you are doing. So in other words, the, um, the development work that you are doing in these countries is a marketing tool for the Canadian government to create a foothold for their for-profit enterprises. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. You know, there's an argument you made that, um, uh, in fact, uh, the Canadian economy should get something out of this, so why not greater penetration into various uh, other, other markets? Right? On the other hand, you can say, wait, well, hey, but that's not altruistic, that's not pure. Well, it depends what you want. So that's a criticism, too. So we're tied to the Canadian business agenda. So I used to say the, the top recipient of Canadian aid was Afghanistan, not anymore. Now it is these countries, Ethiopia, Tennessee, Afghanistan. So it's important, though, that it was Afghanistan because that's where military interests were. And there's a, a common running theme that Western countries, their biggest development interests tend to be also where their military interests are. And you're going to see this a lot when we talk about the USA. Oh, oh more data. Look at that. So we <laughs> still there. Okay, uh, Global Affairs Canada, great. Okay, IDRC. IDRC is the International Development Research Council. It's not uh, a ministry, but it's an agency, I think. I always get the uh, various designations in government confused. There's ministry, agency, crown corporation. Oh, this one's crown, oh, it's crown corporation, that's great. And that matters because um, that dictates who they have to report to. 
whether it's parliament or treasury board or to a minister. If you're reporting to a minister, you're probably going to get cut fairly easily. If you're reporting to the treasury board or directly to parliament, you have a, a greater chance of lasting long term. So um, various conservative governments have attempted to cut the IRC many times, but because they're a crown corporation, they kind of hang on. So they, um, their mandate is really to help um, use Canadian technology and innovation in development. So if you ever watch a commercial about this village here has a new water pump built by Waterloo engineers, yeah, good for them. That's an IDRC probably funded thing. And by the way, are we, are we tired of water pumps yet? Do we have enough water pumps? Like everything's a water pump. All right, fine. So yeah, they're big on technology. And I love the IDRC because they, they invite me to things, so God bless them. All right, um, but they're very overtly Canada-centric, and they make no apologies for that. So um, at least they're transparent. So their objective is to assign more than 5% of our research development investment uh, as development assistance. So let's move on to the Americans. The Americans are interesting um, because uh, their entire tonality changes with every new president. So their main uh, body is called USAID, the United States Agency for National Development, and they're responsible for all the non-military foreign aid. Interesting that they specify non-military foreign aid because a big chunk of their aid is, in fact, either in weapons or in money to buy weapons. So when you read the you know, reports of, we've given this much money away, read the fine print. How many of that is actually weapons or how many of that are loans to buy weapons? They will conflate the two numbers all the time. Right? Um, it's interesting that this changed – the day that George Bush was elected, as USA is vital in U.S. national security, foreign policy, and the war on terror. So these are now development issues. The war on terror is now a development issue, which is fascinating. So their biggest uh, recipient used to be Iraq during the Iraq War. Interesting. So in other words, you invade, you break it, and then you spend money on developing it. In 2013, it was, again, countries they're invested in. So their foreign aid... Uh, 2008, Israel, Afghanistan, Egypt. 2012, Israel, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. The rank has changed slightly, right? It changes as foreign policy priorities shift. I'm moving fast through the slides because there's a lot of slides. This uh, graph shows us, uh, in terms of um, the amount of money spent on foreign countries, the larger the country, the more money spent. Uh, Israel, the largest single recipient of foreign aid. How much of that is in military aid? It's unclear. So this is all military, actually. Uh, Four military they received from the USA. Egypt number two. Okay. So, um, why is that guy? This guy's there because when he was killed, an interesting thing happened. Uh, when he was killed, um, they found him living in Abbottabad, about Pakistan. Do you know how? Do you know the story of how he was found? Okay, it's a good story. What happened was um, they heard rumors that he was there, so they needed DNA samples from the children in the area to determine if his family was there, and they're going to compare it to the samples of the bin Laden DNA they already had on file. And so to get this DNA sample, they actually had a fake public health campaign in about about Pakistan. So it was a Hep B vaccination campaign. Hep B requires three shots, three booster shots. So they showed up, they gave a bunch of kids um, the vaccine, but took their blood at the same time. And they confirmed, in fact, there is bin Laden DNA in the area. And, um, and, and confirming that, they were able to send in their commandos and, and to get them. So I wrote a paper shortly after saying, well, this is a horrific misuse of public health resources, yeah? Well, do you think they care about ethics? <laughs> if you have to kill somebody, you think you care about ethics at that point? So, again, that's the argument I made. Is it's, it's, forget ethics. It's, the pragmatism here is um, this damages the name of, of public health. And the, the journal that published the, the, my paper actually had a disclaimer before it saying, we don't necessarily agree with this paper. Really? Fascinating. Anyway, um, and sure enough, my prediction came true. So a, a months later, m public health officials are being murdered across uh, – um, the South Asian and Middle Eastern world because of concerns that are actually fronts for American Secret Service. And maybe they are, right? There, there was a time in the 70s when that was a common occurrence, when USAID initiatives were in fact fronts for American espionage and military invention. And we think that stopped, but it may be starting again. It's unclear. So here we go. The CIA vaccination program to catch bin Laden makes the Middle Easterners more suspicious of vaccinations. So, criticisms. 
of the USAID is that uh, CIA used USAID as a front for espionage, and it, it happens. This is well known at this point. Um, there's a failure to make the interventions culturally suitable. Example, so uh, our project in Guyana that featured six million of your dollars, thank you very much, to remake the Guyanese public health um, system in response to their HIV crisis, featured us going in, getting a lot of cultural uh, feedback, getting their doctors, their experts, to make a plan and a manual for treating HIV patients that's, that's specific to them. So as we're nearing the end of our mandate, the Americans showed up, and they said, we want to do the same thing. And so um, the local government says, well, you're you going to give us money? Sure we will. So they're happy to take their money and to duplicate the services, which, of course, pisses off entirely. Um, but their version of our manual was to go to Uganda, get their manual, and essentially just change the title. Right? So it wasn't a whole lot of effort. To, do I sound bitter? A little bit. It wasn't a whole lot of effort to make it culturally appropriate for the Guyanese case. We, we negotiated down to, you know, we'll take this chunk, you take that chunk. But um, it was clear that their, their, their desire was to just check off the box. We did something for this country, but it wasn't you know, called, specifically made for that particular case. Um, they are thought to have a poor success rate, and much like the Canadians, a lot of the money stays in, right there in Washington. And I guess I can take you on a tour of a series of mansions built on USAID development money. Okay, PEPFAR. Um, I think I mentioned already that... Uh, Believe it or not, um, many future generations will consider George W. Bush Jr. to be a hero. That's because he, he and Oprah pretty much single-handedly transformed HIV-AIDS in Africa. And George Bush, despite all its flaws, really had a soft spot for AIDS victims in Africa. And he created this thing called PEPFAR. PEPFAR stands for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And at the end of his, his presidency, it became Obama's plan. He changed it slightly. I'm not sure if Trump has a version yet. I have not paying attention that much. And so the, um, the Bush plan ran uh, for these years um, and became the Obama plan. And so they focus on a handful of countries uh, to target HIV AIDS with a decidedly vertical approach. We're going to bomb this shit with a lot of money and expertise. Uh, it was tied, though, to a lot of conditionalities, much like the IMF and World Bank had conditionalities regarding, um, you know, opening borders and reducing uh, currency rates. Their, their programs were tied to certain values. Like, if you wanted to accept PEPFAR money, you had to make sure that your sexual control programs were abstinence only or really focused on abstinence. Right? So you couldn't, be, you couldn't have a safe sex mandate. It had to be an abstinence mandate for unmarried people. Um, we couldn't call um, sex workers sex workers. You had to call them prostitutes, right? It's funny. We call them bush workers as a result, which was a uh, wink, wink, you know what I'm saying? So um, they refused to fund things like safe needle exchange programs that were you know, morally problematic for them. It became problematic when it came to pricing. So they would not allow that country receiving their money to use branded to use generic drugs in any of their major programs. So again, our project in Guyana um, was transformed halfway when Guyana started receiving PEPFAR money. First thing that happened was around the table. Um, so every you know every week we'd meet with the Minister of Health around the table. It's a very small table. Maybe we'd be there, Red Cross would be there, some other people. Then when PEPFAR arrived, suddenly all the churches were showing up, all the religious groups were showing up. So the, the tone of the conversation changed overnight. Um, we also had to scale back our project because at first we were going to wire the entire country with a, uh, a national health information system using open access technology, using what's called Apache servers, which are open access servers, um, uh, unbranded Indian generic drugs that we can purchase for pennies to make sure all the clinics are well supplied. But PEPFAR showed up, we had to get branded drug company you know, uh, drugs like Pfizer and Sanofi and things like that. And we had to use Microsoft servers and Microsoft products. That increased our cost dramatically, so we had to scale back our, our investment to one or two cities rather than the entire country. So it had really bad effects on our own agenda. On the other hand, in places like uh, Uganda or Rwanda, it had undeniably positive effects by just introducing money that otherwise would not have been there. So there are pluses and minuses to everything. The Global Fund. All right, this is fun. Am I doing time-wise? What time's it? Okay, cool. Um, the Global Fund was actually created 
in response to a paper written by a professor in this university, Amir Adaran, who I had beers with just a couple weeks ago. We're talking about this very thing. So um, Amir and Jeff Sachs, who is a very famous economist, and um, <laughs> I got good Jeff Sachs stories. Um, you should look him up. Very famous man, um, possibly should be in jail. Uh, so <laughs> I shouldn't be saying these things on the record. It's horrible. Uh, so Jeff Sachs was one of the economists that was in charge of uh, uh, shock therapy for the Russian economy. You guys remember this, do you? 1989, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian economy was in ruins, and they brought in foreign economists to sort of remake their economy. And one of the things that Jeff Sachs and his friends started was the shock therapy idea, which is nonsense in my opinion, that resulted in the oligarchy you have today with the types of the Putins on top and things like that. And um, a lot of his friends ended up in, you know, in jail for corruption, but Jeff Sachs remade himself into this development figure. Good for him. Like, he means well. So he and Amir wrote this paper that talked about how we need dedicated money to fund a handful of, of diseases in really poor countries. AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Those are the big ones. And these are going to be grants, not loans. Right? So screw this indebtedness thing. Now, uh, Amir have since turned away from the Global Fund, and he's a, criticism of, he's a critic of it, and he feels that, in fact, there's not enough evaluation gone into it, and, and it's not evidence-based very often. As a result, um, the Trump White House recently contacted him, and he's like, what the hell would call me for? What the hell is that all about? And probably because they, um, they want to ask his opinion on how to you know, um, do away with their commitments to it, because they want to fund nothing that involves non-white people. Did I say that out loud? What? That's horrible, Ray. Horrible. <laughs> but, but the original idea of um, the Global Fund is that it's, uh, it's supposed to be based on proven performance, evidence-based. So it's based on evaluation. We evaluate pilot projects. Um, we reassess what's happening. As opposed to the other, project, other programs I talked about, which had very poor evaluation, this is supposed to be all about evaluation. Here's a criticism. If you give a really poor country like, I always mention Chad or Mali because they come to mind. I don't mean to pick on them. But Chad or Mali, like a $100 million grant, can they actually use that money? Do you ever stop and think about it? Do they have a banking system capable of absorbing that much money? Right? Some countries don't. So maybe you need to have a startup process where they have the infrastructure, financial infrastructure, to actually manage that much money. Right? Um, and outcomes are indicator-based. We've got electron indicators already. Maybe we're looking at the you know, um, uh, number of HIV cases, the incidence of tuberculosis, whatever. We, we want to see an improvement. If you don't have baseline data, can you ever show an improvement? Right? That's Amir's really his fundamental point, is that a lot of these places don't have baseline data, so we're putting the, the cart in front of the horse. We need to actually invest in having a baseline survey of everyone's health before we know where to invest. Okay, moving on. Gates Foundation. <laughs> this is actually his, I think his DOI arrest record. Um, founded by Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, regardless of how you feel about Bill Gates and Windows, because Windows, I think their, their marketing strategies back in the 70s and 80s are just atrocious, but, uh, and their product is horrible. But, um, he's done a hell of a lot of good in the world, in my opinion. The thing is, the, the Gates Foundation is crazy wealthy. They're richer than the World Health Organization. That shock you? They are freaking rich. And uh, I want some of that sweet, sweet money. I don't know how to get it yet. Um, I often think about um, why doesn't he just one day decide, well, instead of funding all these programs, why not just adopt Haiti? Just overnight turn Haiti into a, like a first world country, like just right away to do it. They probably could. But instead, they're looking at things like um, creating a malaria vaccine and creating an HIV AIDS vaccine. And he'll probably do it because they're spending just so much money on it, so much effort. Um, because I hear the budget. The budgets are enormous. All right. Clinton Foundation is my combination of the two of them. Now it's run by Chelsea a bit. So they're, uh, I think the foundation may be coming to an end soon. I'm not sure. I haven't watched it that closely. They, they're big on HIV AIDS as well. They focus mostly in the Caribbean, a bit in Africa. Um, but they're looking at um, uh, affordability issues, a little bit of research. So a whole host of other NGOs to think about and talk about, but I won't go into too much. But the point is that they are um, popping up everywhere. 
And here is a list of other research organizations that fund things. The NIH, that's the, that's the American equivalent of the Ministry of Health. So they fund up to $26 million, you know, European Commission, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so who is the principal actor in negotiating access for resources? What we've been focusing focusing on so far is the role of NGOs in funding programs and projects, but they do a whole lot more. So if you have a set of hands, no, you're stretching? All right, cool. <laughs> so if you think about how, when governments make decisions, how do they know what to make decisions about? These are just human beings and often um, flawed human beings, more flawed than you and me, in fact, exceptionally flawed human beings that are in government. And it, it takes an often, a lot of effort for them to consider the voices and perspectives of the kinds of people they're addressing. It falls to the NGOs, the, the advocacy groups, to step up and to represent the voices of various um, low-power individuals. They're the ones who also offer sometimes access to resources. What kind of resources? Well, data. Uh, researchers oftentimes can't get access to certain things, um, but NGOs can. Right? So here are some things that um, NGOs can do. Monitoring. They can actually collect data on the ground to figure out uh, who's being affected by what. Lobbying is a big one. Um, so uh, think about neglected diseases. Um, none come to mind, but there are a lot of smaller diseases that aren't well-known or well-funded. They're they have to be advocated for by small special interest groups. Technical expertise, like um, knowledge of a certain language, knowledge of certain uh, cultural customs, etc. Brokering. Brokering comes in a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of forms. One of the most common ones is conferences. So, in October 28th, 29th, the Canadian Society for International Health here in Ottawa, is, which is an NGO by the way, is hosting Canada's biggest global health conference, and you're all welcome to attend. Um, and uh, they are essentially creating a forum for people to come and to discuss things in global health. It's not a government thing. It's an NGO doing this, right? So government will come. Um, special interest groups will come. Researchers will come. Media will come. And that's how we learn about each other. So um, without them doing that, there is probably unlikely to be a similar forum for that kind of exchange of viewpoints. And fostering inclusion. Think about Aboriginal issues. Would the government independently contact an Aboriginal representation to consult on you know, policies regarding pipelines and things like that? Probably not, unless there's pressure from other groups to do so, saying, I think, you know, I think we should call up this, the tribe that you're going to build the thing on and ask them. Okay. Um, the SDGs we'll talk about on Thursday, maybe online. SDGs are the Sustainable Development Goals, and I'll define what that is later on. But the SDGs, that was invented almost entirely by NGOs with leadership from the UN and places like that. So the process that we'll hear about on Thursday had to do with sending out an online survey, which millions of people took part in, inviting viewpoints from all kinds of advocacy groups to decide what are the development goals for the next 200 years. So <laughs> when I was living in Washington, I think I told you this story before, but I'll tell you again, why not? Um, I couldn't sleep one night, so I went for a walk. It was like 2 a.m., and I saw a movie theater was playing War and Peace. And I thought, hey, great, it's a Russian movie about Napoleonic Wars. That's boring as shit. I'll fall asleep if I go to that thing. But I go, and it wasn't that. It was this. It was this Indian movie, which was gripping. It was about the Indian-Pakistan nuclear arms race, a documentary. And of course, I, I really couldn't sleep. I was gripped. And uh, I, I'll never forget, there was a great scene in that movie as uh, the Indian military was rolling out uh, a nuclear um, aircraft carrier. And they're interviewing these young Indian professionals watching it. And there's one, one young woman that asked, uh, you know, your country is, you know, has millions of starving people who can't get access to basic uh, resources, and yet you're spending tens and hundreds of millions on aircraft carriers and nuclear weapons and a space program. Like, don't you feel bad about, about the poor people? Like, who's going to take care of them? And her answer was, you know, can you guess? Her answer was, that's the job for the foreign NGOs. Okay, so in other words... The foreigners take care of the poor people so that her government can buy nuclear weapons. And she said so proudly. Now, that is not an unusual position to take. And this brings up the larger discussion of the role of NGOs is, are they relieving governments of doing the job they're supposed to do? And that's very much a, um, a neoliberal sort of right-wing position is, maybe we shouldn't be funding all these programs because it's the job of these other governments to do it. Like, why are we spending all this money in, you know, in 
well, India, for example, we still give development money to India when they have a space program and nuclear weapons. It makes, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, unless you think about it politically, where it's being done not to help people, it's being done to leverage a relationship for other purposes. But I'm off on a tangent. It's something to think about. What is the role of an NGO? Is it as a stopgap caregiver? Is it to, um, to replace the services that a government should be given long term? Is it to open the door for other kinds of relationships? I'm not sure. Here's an example of an NGO that does all the things I talked about. So this is um, a lot of my research is in surrogacy, so uh, Indian women being surrogate mothers for um, Western women. Right? So if I try to do research with these surrogate mothers, I can't get access to them. Ethically, as a researcher, the ethics office will never give me access to these women because I, I, they're vulnerable and I, you know, my questions could be alarming. Who knows? Um, media has access, but these NGOs really have great access because they don't have to go through any sort of ethics process. So um, my research is usually through the NGOs. I'll ask them, what, in your experience, who are these women? What are their opinions on this? What are their experiences? How much are they being paid? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they collect the data. They know everything about them, and they advocate on their behalf with media, with me, and with the governments. So they have a critical role. So um, if it wasn't for uh, this group like uh, APCAR Foundation, um, this particular group of women, the surrogates, the surrogates of India, would never have a voice in Parliament where decisions are being made about their livelihoods. So it's a critical role to play. Okay, issues with these funding bodies. We have a fragmented landscape with diverse players. I mentioned the Americans coming into Guyana and something wanting to do the work we've already been paid to do, like let's go far here. Yeah. We have um, funding agendas are separate from the needs of the target nation. So um, I may have been on projects where we have funding that requires us to do things that clearly the population doesn't need. Good example. Needle exchange program, like in Guyana where we're doing this, there is no intravenous drug use, none. Maybe one, there was one case, and he was an American who happened to brought his own drugs. You know, like what, it wasn't the thing. And yet we are required to spend money on a program because that is the agenda of the funder. Projects are disease specific, okay? So if you're there to combat HIV AIDS, well, yeah, you're all about, you know, diagnosing the HIV and treating it, but why do they have HIV? Because they're poor, probably in prostitution as a result, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not addressing the underlying social causes. Um, always, evaluation is a problem. We don't evaluate well. Donor coordination is when we don't have people um, keeping track of, of what's going on, essentially. So again, I give a guy as a good example because they have. Well, they have actually pretty good donor coordination compared to other countries, but um, it would horrify you to see all the different players that show up that are duplicating services. Any given day, I can find you 12 different organizations in the same neighborhood doing HIV awareness in 12 different ways who aren't even aware of each other and often giving conflicting information. Right, so who's supposed to coordinate that? The answer is the government. If the government isn't strong enough, then they can't do so. Or the government doesn't want to say no because then you stop bringing the money in. Right? So going coordination is a huge thing. Why are these donors there in the first place? Is it to do good work? Is it to give experiences for their volunteers? Is it for some other reason? If I were to ask you this question a few weeks ago, you'd probably say, oh, it's, it's because they care about the world. Not necessarily. Right, so some of the work that I've done there, we take doctors and nurses into the deep interior, um, give care to uh, um, you know, to indigenous peoples. Um, that's done, yes, because we care about them, but also because the doctors and nurses want an interesting experience. That money could have been spent much better making DVDs and giving them away to the local caregivers. Okay, but more sustainable. But at a certain point, you have to say, well, here's a trade off. I'll spend this extra money, make sure these doctors and nurses are entertained, they can tell stories when they come back, and maybe in the long term, they will sort of. Uh, invigilate and instill more excitement for this sort of process for the long term. By the way, if you come to my talk on Wednesday, I'll talk more about that and this free food. Fine. Um, and minimal thought, there we go. So we talked about local government uh, responsibility with the Indian case and minimal thought to greater impacts, like showing up. Okay, so I, I was this particular jungle um, where I was working, this, this religious group from the Midwest U.S. would show up and just drump, dump um, antibiotics and leave. 
because they, hey, we have some antibiotics left over from our clinic back home. Let's give them to you. What? That's crazy because, you know, that, as you know, that will use super resistance. So they're not looking at the, the great – they just know that, hey, there's some infection crisis happening here. They could use antibiotics, but they're not stored properly. There's no in, instruction how to use them. And if you don't do the entire course, it leads to microbial resistance. So that shit happens every day. It's, it's annoying. Okay, um, here's a taste of um, – we'll talk about the ethics later on. Um, it's an example of a poorly thought out intervention. This is the gas fire machine, and I talk about the gas fire machine every chance I get because I love the gas fire machine. It's very common in Central American villages. I've seen it in India a few times. Um, what you do, you go to a village, you dig two holes, and you put a, a pipe in between them. In this hole, you fill with water and cow dung and wood chips, and this hole has a big metal dome on top of it. So the fermentation takes place here. Methane seeps into this Thing, raises the dome, and the methane is then, like with a little, little valve here, seeped into the shed where it runs a generator. And this generator then produces free electricity for the entire village. The outputs are electricity, and after this gunk is used up, you end up with a, a high nitrogen fixated fertilizer. Right? Fantastic. What's the problem? What's the negative consequence? Yes. No, no gangs here. No. Nope. This one's gang-free. Yes. No, interestingly, it's really environmentally friendly. It's actually odor-free as well. It's actually an agricultural office, I forgot what country, in which they have one in the lobby to show off how odor-free it is. Yes. Well, they have it now. <laughs> well, you see this part, right? So does that give a hint? Yeah. Not enough cows, almost, almost not enough cows. I'm going to go with this. Who owns the electricity? The ones that own the cows, right? Prior to this, shit was worth shit. Now shit's worth something. So because of our intervention, we, we commoditize something that had no value prior to it. And that's a common occurrence. Anytime, in my experience, anytime a technological solution is introduced, you create a social problem, usually involving the commodification of something that previously had no intrinsic value. Yeah, I mean, dung has intrinsic value, but it now has intrinsic social value. So um, the people on the cows were complaining, well, my cow is shitting in here. How come you're getting my cow's shit electricity for free? I like saying shit in public school. My, my cow's electricity for free. So the solution that was found was that the people who don't have access to their own shit um, collected uh, wood chips, and they're the ones who contribute the wood chips, right? So everyone contributed. Um, but you'll see that as a recurring theme as I give you examples in the ethics uh, class, how technology creates social division, and it's unlikely. Be really wary when someone suggests that there's going to be some instant solution to a problem that's technologically based. It's always wrong. There we go. Those are all those. Yay, you're all free. Beyond, go away. Fair enough.